Hey guys, this is Josh here from Trillium Wild Edibles, and today I want to bring you all another video field guide on how to identify six wild edible or medicinal plants and one plant that is poisonous. This guide is mainly focused on identification, but we will lightly discuss the uses of some of these plants. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. This is a really common medicinal plant, and a lot of people use this plant for colds and flus and immune disorders. However, you do have to be careful whenever you go to use it. But before you go to use this plant, it's important to know how to identify it so that way you don't gather the wrong plant. So let's look a little bit closer at some of the distinct features of this plant. Whenever we look very closely at the flower of Echinacea, we're going to notice this slightly cone shape. Now these flowers are going to be varying in shape from cone all the way to flat. The rays of all of these flower petals are going to vary in shape. However, it's going to have this very distinct pink and purple coloration to it, and sometimes they can be white. And this plant does hybridize very easily with other members of the Echinacea family. The scientific name of this plant is Echinacea purpurea. This plant is, like I said before, very common for use in colds and flus and to boost the immune system. And if we look closely, we're also going to notice these very orange tipped spikes in the inside of the flower. These are actually going to be turning into the seeds of Echinacea. So we want to make sure that we look at this plant and see a cone shape to the flower petals. The flower petals have this distinct purplish magenta kind of pink color to them and the tips inside are spiked and they are orange at the tips. Whenever we look at the leaves of Echinacea, we're going to notice that they are very long. This one is probably about three to four inches long and it's going to come to a very, very fine point once we get towards the tip. Right now it is really hot and has been really dry the past several days. So these leaves are folding up and they're doing that simply so they can serve moisture. But whenever we flatten these leaves out, we're going to notice that there are a lot of sharp teeth and lobes running down the margins or the side of this leaf. If we look at the underside of the leaves of Echinacea, we're going to notice they're much wider than the top of the leaf. And this is a good way to help discern the leaves of Echinacea from other plants. Not simply because the top is green and the underside is white, but if we combine these features together with those identification features of the flower, we're going to get a really good complete profile of this plant. If we look closely at these margins, we can see this lobe right here by the tip of my thumb, and we can also see these teeth running along the margins. Whoops. Let's get rid of that. Sorry, piece of grass. Whenever we look very closely at the sides or the margins of these leaves, we're going to notice this lobe right here with teeth running alongside of it. So the leaves are going to be long, they're going to be sort of lance shaped, the margins are going to have lobes, and they're going to have teeth. These teeth are very distinct right now when I hold the leaf like this. These leaves are going to have a very distinct papery feel. They're going to feel like very, very rough construction paper, and they're covered in all kinds of little bristles and little hairs running along the leaf. Now the stem of this plant is also very, very bristly and very stiff. So let's take a look at the stem and see some of the discerning features of this plant's stem. Now the stem of Echinacea doesn't have too many discerning features about it. It is round, it is very stiff, it feels sort of woody in the hands. However, you guys might be able to see all these little bitty bristles. And these are the little bristles that exist on the leaves, but also on the stem of Echinacea. And it's gonna feel very rough up against your skin. It's gonna feel kind of like sandpaper as you rub these stems and the leaves of this plant up against your fingers. And this is one of the good ways to, det to determine whether or not you have Echinacea or just a different plant. To my knowledge, there's no plant that looks similar to Echinacea. So there's not any toxic lookalikes, which is a really good thing if you're wanting to use this plant for medicine. As we get down towards the ground near the base of the plant, we're going to notice a lot of different stems coming out of the ground. And I usually will only notice one to two stems coming from a plant, coming from any one plant root. However, most likely it's usually one stem per tap root. This plant has a tap root and its tap root is what you're going to be using for medicine. The root of this plant should be dug in the fall like all other roots. 
You don't want to dig this plant up before the fall hits simply because the medical constituents in the root are not as potent as they will be in the fall. This plant was very widely used by Native Americans all over the United States and it's still used heavily in Europe today and in America we're starting to use this plant more and more for colds and flus. There are some things to keep in mind if you plan on using this plant for medicine though for your colds and flus. So let's talk about that for just a little bit. This plant is good for immune disorders, however, not autoimmune disorders. If you have a compromised immune system, it's probably a good idea to stay away from using this plant for a cold and flu. The reason for that is this plant has been found to increase tumor size on people with autoimmune disorders. It's also been found to compromise their immune system. And if you're using this plant for a cold or a normal flu, if you use it for more than two to four weeks, you're going to actually weaken your immune system instead of boosting it. So you need to be very careful when using this plant for medicine. The root is what you're going to use for this plant and you're going to dig it up in the fall. If you dig it up right now in this stage in the middle of summer, the root's not going to be as effective. It still will work, but not near as fast and not near as efficiently as it would if you dug it up in the fall. So if you're going to dig it up in the fall, what considers the fall? Basically, you want to dig this plant's root after the very first frost has happened. What happens in plant roots after the frost hits, the very first frost, is the plant will send all of its energy down from the rest of the plant all the way through the stem down into the root. And that's when we want it for gathering medicine. You guys can see all of these very beautiful cone flowers growing here, and we can also see some of the different shapes that they're going to have. These plants aren't going to always be in a cone shape like the name might imply. You can see this one right here, for example, has a cone shape, whereas this one right here is just a little bit flatter. And if we look all the way around, we're going to notice all of these different shapes from flat to cone shaped on this plant. And we're also going to notice this very distinct spikes coming out of the center with these orange tips. These tips are kind of sharp. They won't hurt you, but they are sharp and they are pokey. They feel sort of like Velcro in the hand. So let's talk about the environment that Echinacea likes to grow in. As you guys can see right now, I'm in this huge field and there's a lot of areas in my part of the country that are trying to restore the long grass prairie. So you want to find a prairie environment if you're looking for Echinacea. All of the Echinacea species that I know of grow in plains and prairie type habitats or even in old fields. Echinacea, the plant that we see in the center, is also very commonly grown in people's yards because people just love the look of these beautiful flowers. Common burdock is an extremely popular medicinal plant and it's very commonly used for many things from diabetes to rheumatism as a blood purifier to help stimulate digestion and even for boils and abscesses or even a wash for hives. But before you go to use it, it's important to know how to identify this plant. So let's take a look at some of its features. At the very top of the plant, we're going to notice the flowers and the seed pods and these are those very common burrs that you're going to get whenever you're walking through fields and dogs oftentimes get these on their fur as well. These are the flowers and the seed pods and this plant will flower anywhere from July all the way through October. The flowers on this plant are dying because, well, it hasn't rained here in a long time. The rain we have had has been so small that it doesn't have enough moisture for these flowers to actually fully grow. But whenever you do see the flowers, they will be a pink to a red or a purplish color. The color can kind of vary a little bit, especially depending on how you interpret the color, but they are generally going to be a pinkish purple sort of color on the flowers. Once the flowers have fully bloomed and opened and pollinated, these seed pods are going to get bigger and bigger and then the flowers will die off. These seed pods have very distinct burrs on them and these are very commonly found and a lot of people know this plant from these, but they don't always know what plant it comes from. However, these feel a lot like Velcro in the hand, and while they're young like this one right here in front of us, they're still very soft. They don't poke or anything, but they will stick to skin and clothing and fur and things like that. There is also another burdock species that's called Great Burdock. Great Burdock 
comes from Asia. However, it is widely used in Asia. But there's a way to tell the difference between common burdock, like we have here, and great burdock. So how do you tell that difference? Well, you look at the very top where the seed pods and the flowers are because the seed pods on great burdock will actually come out of a stem, whereas as we can see here on common burdock, they're very tight. They hug the stem and they hug the leaf sections where they're starting. So that's a really good way to tell the difference. They're both usable in the same ways. There's no difference between how you would use these plants. You can use the leaves, you can use the seeds, and you can also use the root. The taproot is most commonly used of this plant, and besides being medicinal, it's also edible. If we start at the ground to look at the leaves of burdock, we're going to notice how large these basal leaves are. And the leaves are going to get smaller and smaller as you go up the plant, like we saw at the top. These leaves are very broad, they're very long, they're ovate in shape, and the margins are generally going to be slightly wavy and rippled like we can see on this guy right here. But if we look closely at the margins of these leaves, we're also going to notice these very, very tiny teeth running along the margin of the leaf. And now on the basal leaves, these teeth are a little bit more distinct and prominent versus once we get towards the top of the plant, we're going to notice the margins of the leaves start to become a little bit more smooth than the ones on the bottom. So this is a really interesting feature. We also notice that the leaves at the top aren't near as wavy on their margins like they are at the bottom of the plant. However, they do hold the same ovate shape and they are broad. They just get smaller and smaller as we go up the plant. If we look at the main stem on burdock, we're going to notice this very distinct groove running all the way up and down the length of the stem. And this gives it sort of a celery-like appearance. And we can also notice these purplish red striations or stripes or lines running up the stem as well. Right here, if we look at this node, we're going to see this little sheath covering another leaf stem coming out of the main branch. This will also, as we can see, have these red striations or stripes running along its length. If we take a step back a little bit, we can notice the growth pattern on burdock is very bushy. It has a whole lot of stems and stalks coming out of it. We can see all of these multiple stalks and stems coming out of it right here. All of this is from one taproot, so this is just one plant. We can see how many of the leaves are down at the bottom and how big they are versus those smaller leaves as we go further and further up. Now the leaves on burdock do grow in an opposite pattern. Let's take a closer look at one of the higher up stems so we can look at this feature by itself. As we look on this small stem coming out of the main branch, we can see that the leaves are growing in an opposite pattern and they're going to grow opposite all the way up the entire plant, except for the basal leaves, which grow in more of a basal rosette sort of a pattern. So this is another good feature to look for whenever you're looking for this plant because Early in the spring, the leaves do look a lot like rhubarb leaves, which are poisonous. So you do not want to grab the wrong plant. So it can be a good idea to spend a couple years with this plant to see it in all of its growth forms, so that way you don't make a dangerous mistake. If we look very closely in the nodes on the stems, we're going to notice a lot of little bitty leaves coming out, just like we can see right here. But we're going to notice that these nodes grow opposite of each other. They're going to grow on one side, then the other side, then the other side, all the way up the plant. Burdock can grow in a wide variety of habitats, though it's usually found in fields, clearings, on the edges of cornfields. And right behind this plant that we're looking at right now, we actually do have a really good sized cornfield. This, however, is on the edge of my driveway, and behind it there's some willows, there's some wild grapes, and on the other side of that is a small marsh area with a lot of cattails. So you can find it in a wide variety of habitats. I, frequent, I will commonly find this plant growing on the side of roads, especially in forests and parks and things like that. So you want to look in a wide variety of habitats, but you can always identify the second year part of this plant by those burrs. This plant is a biennial, which means that the first year produces its leaves, then the second year it'll shoot up and produce its stems with its flowers and seed pods. You want to use the root, the tap root, of the first year plant for medicine and also for food. 
So make sure you keep that in mind if you're wanting to use this plant. So that right there is how you guys can identify common burdock and a couple of tips on how to separate it from great burdock. They're both usable in the same ways for food and medicine, so that's a really nice thing to have. Now Canadian goldenrod is our most common goldenrod that you're going to find in the United States. However, it is worth noting that there are dozens of species of goldenrod that you can find throughout the entirety of the United States. However, in this video, we're just simply going to be looking at Canadian goldenrod only. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Canadian goldenrod is a very common plant that you're going to find on the edges of fields, clearings, roadsides, prairie-like environments. You're not going to find the Canadian goldenrod deep in the middle of the woods. You want to get out in the clearings and the fields and the prairie-like environments to find your Canadian goldenrod. Now this is a very common plant that a lot of people know for the most part when they see the flowers blooming from July all the way through October. Some people think this plant is what gives them hay fever and some people are allergic to it but the plant that actually is responsible for hay fever is giant or common ragweed. It's not your goldenrods. Now as the name goldenrod might suggest, its flowers are yellow or golden in color and they like to grow in a triangular panicle around the stem. And there are going to be multiple flower branches or brackets all along the stem growing up in a triangular like fashion. If we look at this one, we can see how the flower is wider at the base and then more narrow at the top, making it look like a triangle in its growing form. Also, if we look closely at the flowering tops of goldenrod, we're going to notice all of these stems with bunches of flowers growing along them. This is what's known as a panicle of flowers. Also, another thing that we're going to notice is that the flower stems alternate all the way up the top of the plant. They probably grow on like the top fifth or sixth of the plant, but it's generally the very top of the plant where you're going to find your goldenrod flowers. So now that we've taken a look at the flowers of goldenrod, let's take a look at its leaves and the growth features of its leaves. Now the one thing we're going to notice about goldenrod's leaves is that they grow in an alternating pattern up the stem. And we can see this alternate pattern here and then here. And if I rotate this a little bit, we can see that alternating pattern that these leaves have even more. And in each node, each leaf node, there can be a new branch that will come out. The branch coming out of the node can also support flower buds as well as the very top of the plant. So keep that in mind. Now whenever we look at the leaves of Canadian goldenrod, we're going to notice that they're very narrow and lance shaped. And they do have three prominent veins that we can see right here on the top of the leaf. Also whenever we look at the margins of the leaves on Canadian goldenrod, we're going to notice these very fine serrations or teeth that run all along the margins and each leaf is going to have that. The underside of the leaves of Canadian goldenrod are much lighter than the top of the leaves as we can see here whenever we flip them over. We can also see those three prominent veins running down the leaf and a lot more clarity whenever we look at the leaves up close. Here's another good view of those serrations or teeth that are running along the margins of the leaves of Canadian goldenrod. At the very top of Canadian goldenrod, you're going to notice the leaves are much smaller then once we get towards the bottom of the plant, see how the leaves are getting larger the further down we go towards the bottom of Canadian goldenrod. Now like I said earlier, the Canadian goldenrod is going to be growing in fields, clearings, prairie-like environments, just like we can see right here. All of these little yellow light green flower buds that we see are goldenrod. We can see some of the ones that we were just looking at over there growing right there. Canadian goldenrod will grow anywhere from four to six feet in height, though I usually find it at around five to six feet in height more often than I find it at four feet in height. But that's something to keep in mind is how tall the plant actually grows. Throughout this video, we're just going to go over some of the basic identification factors of this plant. This is a very common plant that you are going to find in your yard. Now one last thing that I want to say before we get into this video is that my voice is going to be a little bit off because I just got over losing my voice. My voice was gone for a couple of days. So I apologize if my voice sounds a little hoarse right now. 
However, the plant that we're looking at right now is Shepherd's Purse. This is a very common plant that loves very poor soil. This one that we're looking at is growing right on the edge of my driveway, for example. Shepherd's Purse usually grows in a single plant at a time, but each plant can send up multiple stalks, like we're seeing here with this plant in front of us. The flowers of the plant are very, very small, and they are white. They happen at the very tops of the plant, and all the way down the stem, you're going to notice these little heart-shaped seed pods. We're going to take a little bit of a closer look at the flowers and the seed pods right now. Shepherd's Purse usually flowers in the early spring, normally starting out at around mid-April for where I live in central Indiana. And it can bloom all the way up until mid-May and sometimes even early June within my area. You're going to notice how the flowers are very small and white, and they also form these clusters at the top of a stem. Each stem that comes out of the plant is going to have its own cluster of flowers at the top. And there are multiple numbers of flowers. There can be 15 or 20 or even more flowers at the top, but it usually ranges anywhere from about 10 to 15 individual flowers at the top of the stem. Now, since the flowers are so small, I'm not actually able to pick them up on my camera close enough to show you the number of petals, but they do have four petals. Each flower will have four petals. So that's another thing to really keep in mind whenever you're looking at this plant and trying to identify it. As we look down the stem on Shepherd's Purse, whenever it starts to produce its seeds, we're going to notice all of these heart-shaped seed pods. Another interesting thing about these seed pods is that these seed pods are actually edible, and they're similar to another plant that looks like this that's called Poor Man's Pepper. And that's because they have a very peppery flavor to them. They are quite delicious, and you can use them in place of black pepper in your kitchen. So that's a cool thing to keep in mind whenever you see this plant. The leaves of Shepherd's Purse are variable. There are actually two different shapes of leaves to this plant. Whenever the plant is in flower and starts to produce seeds like we see in front of us, the leaves are going to be very narrow and linear like we can see on this one right here at the tip of my finger. Get that guy out of the way. The leaves are going to be very thin and linear in shape but they also have some lobes at the back. These leaves grow in an alternating pattern up and down the stem, and they clasp around the stem at the back. Now, if we take a very close look at the stem, we can notice these clasping, alternating leaves. Right here, you can see what I mean by clasping. These leaves clasp and hold on to the stem, and they do have these little lobes at the back that go around the stem. If we turn this around, we can notice this even more as well as noticing the alternate pattern that these leaves have as they go down the stem. On the margins of the leaves, we're going to notice little bitty teeth. The teeth are there, but they are very, very tiny. At first glance, these leaves might look smooth along the margins, but they are not. Also, you might notice how as we go further up the plant, the leaves get more and more small versus they get larger the further down we go on the stem. So that is something to keep in mind. Now the second set of leaves that you are going to see on your shepherd's purse are going to be down at the bottom. This plant starts off with a basal rosette in the very early spring, usually at around March to the middle of April. And at the middle of April, this plant will usually start to send up its stems out of these basal rosettes. Now in your field guides, you're going to probably notice that they're going to describe these leaves as dandelion-like. In my opinion, they look nothing like a dandelion. They're actually very, very different, as we can tell by all of these very sharp divisions on each one of the lobes along this leaf. Now the further into seed that Shepherd's Purse gets, the more and more these basal leaves are going to die off. So that's something to pay attention to whenever you see these shape of leaves in your yard or in your garden or around your driveway. So let's compare these basal leaves to a dandelion leaf. There we can see the shepherd's purse leaf. And now we can see the dandelion leaf. There's the dandelion and there's the shepherd's purse. So these leaves look nothing alike. They are somewhat similar, but they are also very, very different. The stem of Shepherd's Purse is 
pretty indistinct. There's really nothing important to note about this stem. It's round and it's bright green. It's very flexible, as we can see right here. It's very, very flexible. There's really nothing distinct about this at all. So just keep in mind that you don't really need to pay attention to the stem of the plant as much. However, one thing we will notice on the stem is that on a lot of the lower halves of the stem, we're going to see other small stems coming out around the leaves like we can see right here at this joint or at the petiole of the clasping leaf. And we can see this stem has its own leaves and then is also developing its own set of flowers. So that's another interesting feature about this plant is that each node on the lower half of the stem can produce more stems. So you wanna make sure that you're looking for that whenever you're trying to identify this plant. Thankfully, there aren't any toxic lookalikes, to my knowledge, at least not in the US, there may be in other parts of the globe, but in the United States, there are no toxic lookalikes to this plant. So it is very, very safe to identify, it's very safe to forage, and this is also a great plant for children to learn because it is so safe. There are a lot of different ways that you can use Shepherd's Purse whenever you go and forage it. In the early spring, before it sends up its stalks, the basil leaves are actually quite delicious, chopped up into salads. They have a very mild but somewhat peppery flavor. They're very, very good. Now you guys might remember earlier I mentioned the heart-shaped seed pods can be used in place of black pepper in the kitchen. These go really good mixed on top of a chicken, you know, like if you're rubbing a whole chicken down with pepper and seasonings and herbs, these are a great thing to add for that little extra kick. They also go really good in stir fries as well or pastas. You can also use these seed pods in salads for a nice peppery crunch. So that's how you guys can identify Shepherd's Purse and that's a few of the ways that it can be used. Right here in front of us, we can see this three-leaved plant. Now these actually look like leaves, but they are technically leaflets. I'm going to be using a stick to be pointing out some of the features of this plant because I do not want to touch this plant mainly because I have an open wound on my hand. And I do not want to get the essential oil of this plant within my bloodstream, and I don't want to pass it on to anybody else. Someone that I live with is allergic to poison ivy, unfortunately. I myself am not allergic to this plant, but it's also possible to develop allergies over time to this plant. Now, if we look very closely here, we're going to notice these three leaves or leaflets. These are actually leaflets, though they are separated by a little bit of a stem. These are actually leaflets. The leaflets of poison ivy are lance-shaped, and there are going to be lobes or teeth along the margins like we can see right here. We see this little bitty lobe starting. If we look on this one, we can see little bitty lobes again along the margins of the leaves. In the earlier stages of poison ivy's growth, you're going to notice a more glossy appearance. Sometimes the leaflets can appear red or they will be red in color. And that's another key feature to look for. But note that not every poison ivy leaflet or leaf set of leaves will have this feature. As we can see in front of us, there is no red here, just a slight glossy appearance. If we look at these leaves back over here, we can notice that they are kind of dull in green color. They're not red, they're not glossy, but it is poison ivy. You may also notice that lobe, the very distinct lobe to the very bottom right in the frame. If we look over at this one, we can see again that lobe on one of the leaflets. Right here at the tip of the stick, we're going to notice a little red tinge or a little red mark. This is indicative of poison ivy on the tips of the leaflets. I've noticed this on almost every leaflet where the leaf stem joins to each leaflet, there's going to be these red tinges. Now once we're looking at another set of leaves, we can see this red tinging and these red marks that join up right here along the leaflets to the leaf stem at the petiole of each one of the leaflets. There are other plants that have this red mark at this portion of the leaf where the leaf joins the stem. 
that is not in itself indicative of poison ivy. You want to make sure that you're focusing on the leaves and the shape of the leaflets before you just automatically jump to the red marking and red tinging indicating poison ivy. Poison ivy can take various forms. Right in front of us, we're noticing the climbing vine form of poison ivy. It can spread itself through various different means. One of those is by seeds, which are dispersed by animals and birds, because they are, unfortunately for us humans, immune to the essential oil within this plant, and they're able to eat the berries and disperse the seeds. It can also spread itself out by pollination, and it can also spread itself through rhizomes or spreading rootstocks that go throughout the soil, and that is how it can spread, and this vine will continue to spread and climb over whatever it can. Right in front of us, we are noticing the climbing vine version of poison ivy. It can also be a shrub-like plant, or it can also be a creeping plant that kind of creeps along the ground as well. So you want to make sure to keep in mind there are three versions of poison ivy that you may see. As poison ivy climbs along trees like we have in front of us, we're going to notice this woody, vine-like structure growing up along inside of the ridges of the bark. Poison ivy will attach itself through the tree and actually into the tree itself. It can also be destructive to masonry and brickwork. So that's something else to keep in mind when you are looking at this plant. Poison ivy does produce flowers. As we can see right here, they're sort of a whitish green color, and we can see them coming out of the nodes on the leaf stem of the plant. They form in rather dense clusters, just like we can see in front of us. After this plant grows to flower, it will produce berries, and these berries contain the seeds that birds and animals will use to spread this plant. I apologize for the wind, it is extremely windy today. If we look at these leaflets in front of us, we can notice the lobes on the very front leaflet right here on each side, and then we can notice the lobe on the back of the back leaflets. This is another one of the varying shapes of leaves that poison ivy can have. It does have variable leaves, meaning that the leaves can actually uh, have various shapes to them. If we look along the margins of this leaflet right here, we can notice the teeth that are growing along the sides of the leaf or the margin of the leaf. So you're going to notice teeth and lobes growing along the leaflets of poison ivy. So make sure that you keep this in mind whenever you are looking at this plant and trying to identify it. As we follow a mature poison ivy plant up the tree or whatever it is growing on, we're going to notice these clusters of flowers growing out of the axles or the nodes of each set of leaves along the leaf stem of the plant. There are some plants that people confuse with poison ivy, and we're going to talk about one of the major plants that people confuse with poison ivy right now. In front of us is a plant known as Virginia creeper. This is a plant that some people confuse with poison ivy, poison oak, and also poison sumac. However, all of these plants look very different whenever you look at the leaves and the leaf structure of each one of them. As we notice on this one in front of us, this Virginia creeper vine in front of us, we're going to notice there are actually five leaflets. These leaves are divided into a palmate structure instead of divided into individual leaflets like we see on poison ivy. So there are five leaflets on Virginia creeper instead of three that we see on poison ivy. Virginia creeper is a poisonous plant and it contains calcium oxalate crystals within its leaves and its stem. Calcium oxalate crystals can cause an intense burning sensation in the mouth and the throat. This is not a plant to be consumed. However, it does not usually cause a skin rash or dermatitis in people who brush up against it or get the oils on their skin. Some people are allergic to this plant, but not very many are allergic to brushing up against it, like we see with our poison ivy, our poison oaks, or our poison sumacs. Now if we look at the petiole, where all of these leaflets come out on Virginia creeper, there is also a slight red tinge or a red mark. 
just like we noticed on poison ivy. These red marks or red tinges are not always indicative of a poisonous plant. They're not always indicative of poison ivy or Virginia creeper. So make sure you keep that in mind when you are trying to identify a plant that may be poisonous, that not all of them are going to have these, and just because a plant does have these red marks or red tinges also does not make it poisonous. Virginia creeper is also a climbing vine, just like poison ivy is. However, Virginia creeper is not destructive to masonry or brickwork because it attaches through a completely different mechanism than poison ivy. It generally prefers high up ridge tops and somewhat drier soil. Like right now, I am in an oak forest, so the soil is a little bit acidic and it's also a little dry. Now this is a plant that usually flowers through July all the way through August, and it is related to the domestic sunflower that you are probably used to seeing in your garden. The woodland sunflower has these very beautiful yellow flowers that stick out in the middle of its blooming season, which is from July through August. So let's take a close look at some of the features of this plant. Whenever we look very closely at the flower of woodland sunflower, we're going to notice numerous ray-like petals coming out from the very center of the flower. And then on the inside of the flower, we're going to notice this cluster of tube-shaped flowers as well. These are where the pollinators, like we just saw a second ago, like to come and get the pollen. The woodland sunflower is a very distinct flower in the sense that it has numerous ray-like petals, but it also has this cluster of tubular flowers on the inside where we can see this little guy trying to pollinate it right now. He's the reason why I'm not touching the plant like I normally do. Oh, something just happened. Because I don't want to disturb the pollinators. Another thing to notice is that there's no seeds that we can see on the inside. There are no seeds that I know of that are edible on this plant. I'm not sure if the, any other parts are edible. Maybe the greens are, but I'm not sure. I do know, however, that this plant is not poisonous but I don't know if it's edible. I've tried it before and I did not like the taste of the leaves. I found them to be too bitter. Okay, our little pollinating friend has left us here. So let's take a close look at the stem of the woodland sunflower for its identification features. If we look very closely at the top of the stem on the woodland sunflower, we're going to notice a lot of these fine little bitty hairs. We can also notice these hairs on the leaves as well. And at the very top of where the flower joins the stem, we can notice these green flower bracts on the underside of the plant. Now these little hairs that we see on the top of the stem are not going to go down the entirety of the stem. They're usually on the upper third portion of the stem. As you guys might notice right here on this section of the stem, we don't see any of those little bitty hairs. And the hairs get very, very small whenever it comes to the leaves, the further you go down the plant. So make sure you keep in mind that the upper portion of the plant is where the hairs are going to be. Whenever we look at the leaves of woodland sunflower, we're going to notice a couple things right off the bat. One is that they're somewhat narrow, very long, and lance-shaped. The leaves are probably going to be anywhere from one and a half to two and a half inches in length, and they're going to join at the stem right near the base like we can see right here. There's not very much leaf stem that sticks out. These leaves are not perfoliate leaves, but they do look like it at first glance until we get up close and actually look at them like we can see right here. The leaves grow in an opposite pattern all the way up the stem, meaning that they'll grow on opposite sides, and then it'll rotate 90 degrees for each set of leaves up the plant, opposite all the way up and down the stem. If we look very closely at the margins of the leaves on the woodland sunflower, we're going to notice very small serrations running along the margins all the way up and down the sides of the leaves. So that's an interesting feature to keep out for. The underside of the leaves is slightly lighter in color than the top, but not by very much. If we compare the top of this leaf to the underside of it, we can see that the underside is just a little bit lighter. We can also see more of the leaf stem right there. Whenever you're holding woodland sunflower in your hand and you rub the leaves, they're going to feel very rough and papery. So if you rub them in between your fingers, what you're feeling is those fine little hairs and bristles that it has all along the leaves. 
Now if we look very close, we can see all these little bristles on the leaves. And this is what we're feeling that makes them feel very rough to the touch. Whenever you find one woodland sunflower, you're probably going to be finding a whole lot of them, generally because their seeds don't spread very far. Now these plants are, like I said earlier, and like the name implies, woodland growing. So you're going to find them in woods. Now I generally find them more around oak forests than I do uh, wet maple forests and beech forests, but it is possible to find them there as well. But if we look around, we can see woodland sunflowers there, we can see some over there, we can see one there, we can see more here, we can see more all throughout here. And if we look around, even towards the back, in the dark almost, we can see another one there. The woodland sunflower is going to grow anywhere from two to four feet in height whenever it reaches full maturity. And if you get a lot of rain, you're going to see them closer to that four foot height. Versus right now, we haven't had much rain in my area. So these seem to be topping out at around two and a half to three and a half feet. But still not a very big difference in height from other full on mature growth. Yellow sweet clover is the plant that we're looking at right here. It's not technically a clover species, but it does have the name yellow sweet clover because its leaves are in a clover-like arrangement. This is a very common plant that's found growing along trails and roadsides, and it could even be found in some drainage areas where the ground has been heavily cleared. Sometimes you can find it growing in thick prairie-like environments as well, so it has a few different locations that it likes to grow, but it generally prefers kind of dry soil but not too dry. The soil has to have some moisture but not too much. You're not going to find this plant in the middle of a forest or you're not going to find it either in a marshy like area where you might find cattails. There can be a little bit of overlapping in some of these areas like for example the area I'm in now is a little bit of a ditch and there is some jewelweed growing here as well and jewelweed does like moist environments. This plant is very easily noticeable by its very brightly colored yellow flowers that it has growing up on these spikes along the top of the stem. If we look very closely at the flowers of yellow sweet clover, we're going to notice that there are many flowers on each spike and each plant can produce multiple spikes of these yellow flowers. The flowers of yellow sweet clover will usually have a upper lip that is much larger than the bottom petals underneath it. There are about five petals on each flower, and there can be multiples of flowers, upwards of multiple dozens, several dozens of flowers on just one spike. And on this plant, we see about three or four spikes, and we see some little more buds starting at the top right up here. Yellow sweet clover likes to bloom anywhere from April all the way through October, and that will heavily depend on the area that you're in, but it does have a very large flowering season and it's somewhat easy to notice amongst all the other green foliage because of these yellow flowers. This plant can grow anywhere from two to six feet tall. I have seen some a little over six feet, but that generally seems to be whenever there is a lot of competition around them and they are trying to reach towards the sun. But on average, you're going to find this plant probably at around three to four feet tall. The one we're looking at right now is a little over three feet, I'm assuming because whenever I stand up, it's right around my waistline. And I'm almost, I'm about six feet tall. So this plant right here is about three feet in height. Now let's take a look at the features of the leaves of yellow sweet clover. The leaves of yellow sweet clover are very different from your normal clovers you're going to find in your yard. As we can see here, they are very long and elongated in shape. At the top of the plant, they can be almost linear, like we can see on these right here. They are arranged in clusters of three, but you'll notice that there is a little bit of a leaf stem right here from the very front leaflet. The back two leaflets are usually very close together like we can see here. And as we go further down the plant, the leaves will also get larger, but a little bit more rounded. And now we might also see some anomalies like these right here where it's a little bit more rounded at the base and not as linear and as pointy at the tip as these are. Okay, now here we are at the base of the plant and we can notice these leaves are actually much larger than what we see at the top. Now we can also see some of these very, very tiny leaves right here back by my index finger. And as we go down the plant, we're going to notice more of these spikes of yellow flowers. 
there will be yellow flowers all the way around the entire plant, basically coming out of each node. So make sure you keep that in mind. Also, if we look at the margins of the leaves, we're going to notice that they have fine teeth or fine serrations all along the margins of them. The underside of the leaves are noticeably whiter than the top side of the leaves, kind of this gray sort of appearance. This in itself is in its own identification feature, but it is something to keep in mind, as a lot of plants actually have lighter undersides than their tops. Yellow sweet clover has an alternating leaf pattern, just like we can see right here. We see a leaf, then a leaf, and then another leaf. And the leaves will alternate all the way up and down the stems of this plant. Not only is the leafing pattern alternating on yellow sweet clover, but the branching pattern is also alternating, like we can see that branch coming out there, and we see another branch coming up at the top. The stem of yellow sweet clover is basically just green and round and rather plain. However, it is really stiff. Whenever you feel it in your fingers, it feels rather hard, but it does bend very easily. Yellow sweet clover does have some use for food and medicine. This plant actually contains coumarin, which is notably responsible for preventing blood clots. It doesn't work necessarily as a blood thinner to my knowledge, but it does help the blood to flow. So whenever you're taking this plant for medicine, make sure you keep that in mind. The chemical coumarin is also partly responsible for this plant's fra fragrance. Whenever you take the flowers or the leaves or the stem and crush them and rub them in between your finger, you're going to notice this very fragrant and potent smell of a little bit of cinnamon mixed with a lot of typical green plant flavor that you might expect from any normal plant. You can simply take the flowers and the leaves of this plant and you can brew them into a nice tea just for a refreshing drink, or you can use that tea as medicine as well. So there are some uses to this plant. Now there's another plant that's related to this, Melilotus alba, that is white, white sweet clover. Now white sweet clover can also be used as a vanilla-like flavoring because of the amount of coumarins in it and other chemicals that are responsible for this vanilla-like scent. However, our yellow sweet clover that we're looking at does not have that use. So make sure you keep that in mind if you see a plant that looks like this but has white flowers instead of yellow, it's probably going to be a white sweet clover and not a yellow sweet clover. So that concludes the sixth video field guide on wild edible and medicinal plants. And I hope this video was helpful for you all in learning how to identify them. I thank you all for watching this video and I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to learn more about wild edibles or medicinal plants, please make sure